we would like to send out a special thanks to the fun and challenging Best Fiends, the infamously impossible to put down puzzle game. Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Thank you and enjoy the show. August 23rd, 1987, Saline County, Arkansas. 16 year old Don Henry and 17 year old Kevin Ives head into the woods to go hunting, but never return. Hours later, the two boys are seen lying on some tracks before they are run over by a cargo train, and a medical examiner concludes that they had fallen asleep after smoking marijuana and their deaths were accidental. However, Don and Kevin's families push for a new investigation, which uncovers evidence that they were violently attacked before their bodies were placed on the tracks. Throughout the years, a number of conspiracy theories emerge to suggest that the boys were murdered as part of a mammoth cover-up involving drug trafficking, but no one is ever charged for the crime. After that, the trail went cold. Hello everyone and welcome to a very special milestone for The Trail Went Cold, our five-year anniversary show. I'm your host Robin Warner, and yes, I cannot believe that we have been producing this podcast for that long. In the past, it's been a yearly tradition for us to hold a poll in which our listeners could vote on which case they would like to see featured on our anniversary episodes, but over the past few years, I've noticed that there was one case in particular which always seemed to finish in second place in the polls. Given how it's one of our most highly requested cases ever, and this is such a big milestone, I thought now would finally be an ideal time to cover the 1987 deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives, aka the Boys on the Track case. And since this is such a convoluted story, I've decided to go all out and make this a two-part episode. Anyway, that voice you just heard narrating our intro was Ryan Hanna, the latest winner of our most recent Trail Went Cold listener voiceover contest. Ryan has been a listener of this podcast since day one, and knows the backstory of this case pretty well since he watched the original Unsolved Mystery segment, and February the 18th, the day after this episode's release, just happens to be his birthday, so happy early birthday, Ryan. We've been holding our monthly listener voiceover contest for over three years now, and if you'd like to enter and haven't already done so, I will be providing instructions at the end of this episode. So I'm sure that many of you are already familiar with the Boys on the Track case because it was featured on one of the earliest episodes of Unsolved Mysteries, and it still ranks as one of the creepiest segments they ever produced. But over the years, this story has escalated into something much larger than the murders of two teenage boys. There have been allegations of drug trafficking and massive corruption among some very powerful people, leading to speculation that Don Henry and Kevin Ives were killed as part of a large-scale cover-up. As a result, this case is surrounded by conspiracy theories, and they even involve future President Bill Clinton, who happened to be governor of Arkansas when the crime took place. Now, I've put off doing an episode about this story for quite some time, not only because it's such a massive rabbit hole, but because it's surrounded by so much conspiracy talk that it can sometimes be hard to separate fact from fiction during the research process. One of the primary sources I'm using is a book published by investigative journalist Mara Leverett titled The Boys on the Tracks, Death, Denial, and a Mother's Crusade to Bring Her Son's Killers to Justice, which is probably the most balanced look at the case. There's also a website, idfiles.com, that contains a number of original documents from the Arkansas State Police and FBI investigations, and while many of these documents are heavily redacted, they still contain some useful information. But there's a lot of material to sift through, so on part one of this episode, I will be laying out the basic facts of the story. And in part two, which drops next Wednesday, February the 24th, I will provide my theories and analysis and go over some of the crazy side stories associated with this case. So prepare yourself for a very wild ride. But before we get started, just a quick reminder that The Trail Went Cold is a weekly podcast, which is currently available for download on several platforms, including iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and Spotify. So if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it, and please leave us a rating or review on any of those sites to help spread the word. The Trail Went Cold is on Patreon, so if you would like to learn how to support the show, please visit our page at patreon.com slash thetrailwentcold. For as little as $1 a month, you can garner access to exclusive rewards, which may include stickers and thank you cards, early access to episodes, and bonus content. So with all that out of the way, let us now dive down the rabbit hole and explore the deaths of Don Henry and Kevin Ives. Our story begins in Saline County, Arkansas in 1987. Our central figures are 16-year-old Don Henry and 17-year-old Larry Kevin Ives, who goes by the name Kevin. Don lives with his father and stepmother, Curtis and Marvell Henry, in Bryant, a suburb of Little Rock which has a population of around 5,000 people. Kevin resides in Benton, a larger Little Rock suburb, and lives with his parents Larry and Linda Ives. Even though Don and Kevin have only known each other for six months, they have become very close friends and are preparing for their senior year at Bryant High School. On Saturday, August the 22nd, the last weekend before school was scheduled to start, 
Don and Kevin met up with some friends and spent much of the evening hanging out in a commuter parking lot on the outskirts of Little Rock. The two boys eventually headed back to Don's mobile home, where Kevin told his parents he was planning to spend the night, and they arrived shortly after midnight on August the 23rd. While Kevin waited on the porch, Don went inside and told his father, Curtis, that he and Kevin were planning to go out hunting in the woods behind the residence, so he grabbed his 22 caliber rifle, as well as a large flashlight. The two boys were likely going to engage in a form of night hunting called spotlighting, where Kevin would shine the flashlight directly into the eyes of an animal before Don fired his rifle at it, and while the practice was technically illegal in Arkansas, it was still a very widespread activity in the area. After Don left the mobile home, he and Kevin walked off into the woods, but sometime over the course of the next four hours, they would find themselves at the center of a bizarre unsolved mysteries. Later that morning, a three-engine, 6,000-ton Union Pacific Railroad cargo train, which was 75 cars and one mile long, was traveling on its run from Texarkana to Little Rock. It passed by the town of Alexander and was traveling through a wooded area in Saline County, and the crew consisted of engineer Stephen Schroyer, conductor Jerry Tomlin, and brakeman Danny Delamar. At around 4.25 a.m., they had passed by a crossing at Chobe Road when the crew suddenly noticed what appeared to be two people lying on the tracks ahead of them. Even though they immediately hit the emergency brakes, the train was traveling at 52 miles per hour at this point, so there was no way it would be able to come to a complete stop before it reached the people on the tracks. Schroyer kept frantically sounding the diesel horn in order to warn them about the oncoming train, but said he never saw any movement or reaction. The train barreled right through the two people and wound up dragging them for a half mile before it finally came to a stop. The victims were horribly mangled and their body parts spread across the area. After the Saline County Sheriff's Office were summoned to the scene, the victims were eventually identified as Don Henry and Kevin Ives. Ironically, Kevin's father, Larry Ives, was also employed as an engineer for Union Pacific Railroad and had traveled that same route for years before he was transferred and replaced by Stephen Schroyer two months before this incident. If this had not taken place, Larry could have been the engineer inside the locomotive when his son was killed. The location on the tracks where this incident took place was about a mile away from Don's mobile home. The train's crew members all maintained that before the locomotive ran over the two boys, they had both been lying parallel on the tracks in identical positions with their arms straight down by their sides and legs over the rails. Don's 22 caliber hunting rifle and flashlight had also been lying on the gravel beside them before they were shattered into pieces. The crew had also reported seeing a light green tarp partially covering Don and Kevin's bodies, even though neither of the boys owned such a tarp. Jerry Tomlin would later claim that after the police arrived, he walked the tracks and discovered the tarp with his flashlight before he directed one of the deputies towards it. But curiously, the deputy later denied that this exchange ever took place, and since there was no official record of the tarp having been found, law enforcement would question its existence and even alleged that the crew may have been experiencing a quote-unquote optical illusion when they originally saw it. However, Schroyer, Tomlin, and Delamar would all maintain that the tarp had been there. Indeed, there were a lot of questions about how the Saline County Sheriff's Office handled the investigation as they failed to secure the scene and properly collect evidence. It seemed like they were content to treat the scene as an accident or even an elaborate double suicide rather than explore the possibility of foul play. In fact, the county sheriff, Jim Steed, never even bothered to show up at the scene that morning. Believe it or not, one of Kevin's severed feet was never collected and was left behind on the tracks inside its tennis shoe for nearly two days before it was discovered by a civilian. Later that week, Larry Ives and some of his friends were exploring the site and found a large piece of cardboard which appeared to have a blood stain on it. Around that same time period, Curtis Henry found pieces of what appeared to be a gun in the same area. While both of these items would be turned over to a representative of the Arkansas State Police to be examined by the Arkansas State Crime Laboratory, they wound up going missing without explanation. Don and Kevin's bodies were also sent to the state crime lab to be examined by the Arkansas State Medical Examiner, Dr. Fahmy Malik, and he was soon ruled that their deaths were accidental. According to Dr. Malik, the two boys had both passed out on the tracks because they were under the quote-unquote psychedelic influence of THC after having smoked the equivalent of 20 marijuana cigarettes, which left them in such a deep sleep that they were unable to hear the oncoming train. Well, needless to say, the victims' families had a hard time accepting this ruling. While there were witnesses who reported having seen the boys smoke marijuana in the hours prior to their deaths, and two grams of weed were found in the pocket of Kevin's pants, it seemed very unlikely they could have smoked up to 20 joints. Curtis Henry maintained that Don was completely lucid when he stopped by their home after midnight, and since the noise level produced by the train reached a volume as loud as 98 decibels, it was not believable that both boys could have been stoned enough to lie down on the tracks in virtually identical positions and sleep through the entire thing. Furthermore, since Don always took good care of his hunting rifle, Curtis was skeptical that his son would have risked scratching it by lying the rifle down on the gravel. There were also concerning eyewitness reports from that night of an unidentified man dressed in camouflage military fatigues who had been seen walking down a road located less than 200 yards from the spot where the boys' bodies were discovered. One week earlier, Danny Allen, an officer from the Bryant Police Department, had received reports of a suspicious-looking man in military fatigues in the same vicinity. Allen came across this man walking down the road and pulled over to question him, but without warning, the man pulled out a gun and fired a shot through the patrol car's blue light before running away. 
Alan was not harmed and organized a search of the area for this man, but he was never located, and there was speculation that he might somehow be connected to the deaths of Don and Kevin. The Ives and Henry families would hire their own private investigator to work on the case for five months, but he kept getting stonewalled and running into resistance from all the investigating agencies. Finally, in February of 1988, the two families decided to hold their own press conference in order to express their personal frustration about how the case was being handled and the story would run statewide in newspapers and on television. The strategy seemed to pay off, as Linda Ives was soon contacted by Richard Garrett, the newly appointed deputy prosecuting attorney of Saline County. Garrett expressed an interest in re-examining the case and decided to hold a public three-day prosecutor's hearing at the Saline County Courthouse in front of 7th Judicial District Circuit Judge John Cole, where testimony would be heard from a number of key witnesses and new evidence would be presented. One thing which always concerned Garrett was a notation in the medical report from Shirley Raper, one of the emergency medical technicians who had arrived at the scene that night. She wrote, quote, Blood from the bodies and on the body parts we observed was a dark color in nature. Due to our training, this would indicate a lack of oxygen present in the blood and could pose a question as to how long the victims had been dead, end quote. Indeed, even the train's crew had openly expressed their surprise at the blood they saw at the scene, as it did not appear to be fresh, which suggested that the boys could have already been deceased before they were run over by the train. After the prosecutor's hearing took place, Garrett believed that the evidence was strong enough to set aside Fahmy Malik's original ruling and submit the case to a grand jury. Two separate toxicologists provided a second opinion on Malik's findings and concluded that it was very unlikely that large quantities of THC could have caused two separate people to fall into a deep sleep. As a result, Judge Cole had the boys' cause of death officially changed from accidental to undetermined. The grand jury proceedings would be held in front of Judge Cole, and Garrett requested that his law partner, Dan Harmon, be appointed to the role of special prosecutor in order to lead the investigation. Don and Kevin's bodies were both exhumed so that new autopsies could be performed by a nationally recognized forensic pathologist named Dr. Joseph Burton, who was currently the chief medical examiner for North Metropolitan Atlanta. Burton confirmed that each boy had likely only smoked one to three marijuana cigarettes on the night of their deaths, which would not have been nearly enough to cause them to pass out. On the basis of Burton's findings, the grand jury would rule that the boys' official cause of death should be changed to probable homicide. While all this was going on, the case captured the attention of Unsolved Mysteries, which up until this point had only been a series of individual specials which aired on NBC, but had finally been picked up and turned into a full-time series. They were planning to feature a segment about this story on the second episode of their first official season, which was scheduled to air on October the 12th. However, while this segment was being filmed, Dr. Burton decided to perform tissue and clothing tests on Don's t-shirt. It had not been on Don's torso at the time he was found, and the train crew were certain that he was already shirtless before he was run over. Burton analyzed a torn section in the fabric on the back of the shirt and concluded that it was a cut, as there were traces of red blood cells around it. The position of the cut seemed to coincide with a 5-inch puncture wound on Don's back, so Burton became convinced that he was stabbed with a large knife before his body was placed on the tracks. A former employee from the Arkansas State Crime Lab would later come forward and claim that he had noticed this stab wound during the original autopsy, but Fahmy Malik told him not to worry about it. In addition, Kevin also appeared to have a pattern wound on his left cheek, which seemed to suggest he had been smashed in the face by the butt of a rifle, likely the same hunting rifle which Don had been carrying. Unfortunately, Fahmy Malik had inexplicably mutilated Kevin's skull by sawing it in a number of different directions during the autopsy, so it was impossible to determine if he had suffered any skull fractures. But this new evidence conclusively showed that Don and Kevin were either dead or unconscious before they were even run over by the train, which compelled the grand jury to once again change the cause of death from probable homicide to definite homicide. After the Unsolved Mysteries episode aired, their telecenter immediately started receiving a number of phone tips, most of them anonymous, which alleged that Kevin and Don had been murdered by drug dealers. A month and a half later, on November the 30th, the show aired a brief update segment in which Richard Garrett was interviewed by Robert Stack. Garrett stated that Saline County and the Central Arkansas area were currently being overrun with drug trafficking, which extended into other counties and states, and he expressed his belief that Kevin and Don may have been killed because they stumbled upon something they weren't supposed to see, such as a drug lab which manufactured methamphetamine and some sort of cover-up was taking place. By this point, the grand jury investigation was still going on, and it would not come to an end until December the 31st. While the boys' deaths had finally been reclassified as homicides, no indictments were handed down. To their disappointment, Judge Cole ruled that the grand jury could not render most of their findings on the record, and only allow them to release an edited, one-and-a-half-page version of a report they had prepared. The report expressed their belief that the murders were likely drug-related, and the jury's foreman stated, quote, We find that there is a tremendous drug problem that exists in Saline County. But before we continue, we would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Best Fiends. We all have our own forms of entertainment which are guilty pleasures, whether it be a campy TV show, a cheesy movie, or maybe even the latest Netflix true crime series. While I definitely have a devout interest in true crime, I do have my fair share of guilty pleasures, such as professional wrestling, 
which I will be making reference to later on on this very episode. But you know what hobby I don't feel any guilt about? Playing Best Fiends. It provides me with an endless source of entertainment that I can access on my phone at any time. It's a puzzle game unlike any other, as it literally has thousands of levels and new content added all the time. And after playing Best Fiends for over a year, I guess you could say, I'm pretty obsessed. I've covered a lot of unsolved cases on this podcast which are like massive jigsaw puzzles, particularly on today's episode, but the puzzles on Best Fiends are insanely fun, and you always get that rush of adrenaline whenever you beat a level. I guess it's only appropriate that now that we've reached the special milestone of the five-year anniversary of our podcast, I can announce that I've recently passed another special milestone of beating level 1000 on Best Fiends. The game has been a great source of fun, so if you'd like to experience it yourself, download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play and get started and let me know what you think. I may have said that I cracked level 1000, but Best Fiends gives you over 5,000 good puzzles, and since more levels, events, and challenges are added all the time, you don't have to choose between binging and boredom. Download Best Fiends free today on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of this episode. In spite of the new ruling from the grand jury, Saline County Sheriff Jim Steed continued to maintain that Kevin and Don's deaths were accidental, and refused to allow any funds to be used on a new investigation. Of course, Steed faced a lot of public criticism from the victims' families, which seemed to create enough of a backlash that in November of 1988, he wound up losing his re-election for Saline County Sheriff. While all this was going on, Linda Ives pretty much assumed the role of becoming the biggest public advocate for the two boys. In September of 1989, Linda filed a complaint about Dr. Fahmy Malik to the Arkansas Medical Society, demanding that Malik be terminated from his position as state medical examiner. She accused Malik of conducting himself in a quote-unquote grossly unethical manner on her son's case. In spite of the new evidence, Malik refused to waver from his original story that the boys had fallen asleep on the tracks after smoking marijuana, prompting Linda to state, quote, in my opinion, he has slandered my son by labeling him a dopehead. Well, it turned out that the Iveses and Henrys were not the only bereaved families who had gone through the experience of losing a loved one and having their investigations into the deaths be hampered by Malik's incompetent work. In fact, they eventually formed an organization called VOMIT, an acronym for Victims of Malik's Incredible Testimony. I'm going to hold off on sharing any specific examples of these other cases Malik is alleged to have botched until part two of this episode, but I have to say that some of his incompetent decisions are seriously mind-boggling. However, the main obstacle which seemed to prevent Malik from losing his job were his supposed ties to none other than Bill Clinton, who was serving as governor of Arkansas during this time period. Clinton was the one who originally approved Malik's appointment to Arkansas State Medical Examiner during his first term as governor, and the prominent rumor was that Clinton always had Malik's back because of a situation involving Clinton's mother, Virginia Dwyer Kelly. In 1981, Kelly had been working as a nurse esthetist at Washita Memorial Hospital in Hot Springs, but found herself in a lot of hot water when a 17-year-old patient named Sally Deer, who had been hit in the head with a piece of concrete, was brought in for treatment. The injuries were not life-threatening, but Deer went into cardiac arrest and died during surgery, and it was alleged that this occurred because Kelly had improperly inserted the breathing tube. She could have potentially faced serious liability for this, but Fahmy Malik wound up performing the autopsy on Deer, and he concluded that her death was a homicide caused by the blunt trauma of being hit in the head with the cement. Since there was no mention of Kelly's issues with the breathing tube in Malik's report, she was cleared of any wrongdoing, though many believe that Deer never would have died without Kelly's mistake. Whatever the case, it seemed like from this point on, Malik was immune from losing his job, no matter how many complaints Governor Clinton received about his work. In fact, in March of 1988, while Malik was facing criticism about his performance on the Ives-Henry case, Clinton used $20,000 from the governor's emergency fund to hire two out-of-state pathologists to review Malik's performance. In the end, not only did these pathologists give Malik high marks, but they also recommended that he receive a raise. It would not be until September of 1991, just three weeks before Clinton announced his bid to run for president, when public pressure finally forced Malik to resign as state medical examiner, though he would be quickly moved into a $70,000 a year job as a consultant for the Arkansas Health Department. Now, I'm going to address more of the conspiracy theory surrounding Bill Clinton later on, but it seems like his controversial association with Malik is what got him linked to the case in the first place. Anyway, the Ives and Henry families would continue to experience frustration as in March of 1990, over a year after the grand jury investigation concluded, they discovered that Don and Kevin's death certificates still listed their cause of death as accidental, and they had to petition the court to get them changed to homicide. Even though the Saline County Sheriff's Office had been content to write off the boys' deaths as accidents, the Arkansas State Police spent two years performing their own investigation, and Linda Ives would be granted access to their files, where she came across some surprising information she had not been aware of before. It turned out that in June of 1988, Ronnie Godwin, an inmate in the Jefferson County Jail, was interviewed by the state police, and he told them that on the night of Don and Kevin's deaths, he had been driving home after some heavy drinking, and noticed an unmarked police car in the parking lot of the Ranchette grocery store located near Shoe Road, 
which happened to contain the crossing the Union Pacific train had passed through right before it ran over the two boys. Not wanting to get busted for a DUI, Godwin pulled over into a lot across the street in order to hide behind two trailers until the police left. However, he noticed that two men in plain clothes were beating up two teenage boys in the parking lot next to the phone booth. One of the men picked up what appeared to be a 22 caliber rifle off the ground, and both the rifle and the two boys were placed inside the police car. When the car left the scene, Godwin witnessed it travel up a hill on a dead-end road. Godwin waited around until the vehicle returned about 5-10 to 10 minutes later, but he did not see the boys inside, though he thought he saw something which looked like a garbage bag. While he did not realize it at the time, Godwin became convinced the boys were Don and Kevin. While around the same time period Linda made this discovery, another inmate named Mike Crook, who was serving time in the Garland County Jail for drug offenses, shared a similar story with a state police sergeant, only he was telling it secondhand. Crook happened to own the same nightclub where Godwin had been drinking that night, and the following evening, Crook spoke with a regular patron at the club, whom he only knew as Jerry. Crook claimed that Jerry told him he had witnessed two men beating up two teenage boys in that same parking lot at the Ranchette grocery store before they were thrown in a police car and driven away from the scene. The key difference with Godwin's story is that Jerry said he saw a third boy there on a motorcycle who immediately fled the scene when the police car arrived. According to Crook, Jerry seemed to believe that the two boys were Don Henry and Kevin Ives, so Crook convinced him to report what he had seen to the Saline County Sheriff's Office. However, the story goes that Sheriff Steed had Jerry thrown in the county jail for failure to pay child support, and he remained there for 90 days before leaving town upon his release. Now, it's never been conclusively established who the mysterious Jerry was, and even though Ronnie Godwin and Mike Crook were related by marriage, the consensus seems to be that Godwin was not Jerry, and these were two completely independent eyewitnesses sharing the same story. However, Godwin's credibility as a witness was called into question, as his family reportedly told the authorities that one could not believe anything he said when he was drinking. So here's where things start to become really complicated. If you do any research on this story, you'll come across lists about a number of unsolved murders which took place in Saline County in the years following the deaths of Kevin and Don. The main reason these deaths are often linked to this case is because a number of the victims had been subpoenaed to testify at the grand jury proceedings, though most of them failed to appear. In order to avoid losing focus, I'm going to hold off on discussing a lot of these deaths until part two of this episode, but there are two victims I want to talk about right now, because they have eyewitnesses placing them at key locations on the night of the murders. Okay, so you might recall me mentioning that in Jerry's account of Kevin and Don being beaten in the parking lot, he described seeing a third boy who fled the scene on his motorcycle before the police arrived. If Jerry's story is true, it's been theorized that this might have been 19-year-old Keith Coney who had a history of run-ins with the law. Like I just mentioned, Coney was one of many witnesses who had been called upon to testify at the grand jury proceeding and never showed up, but on May the 17th, 1988, Coney was killed after crashing his motorcycle into the back of a semi-trailer truck on Interstate 40. This normally wouldn't arouse suspicion of foul play, but it's been rumored that Coney was being chased by someone before the crash, and witnesses who saw Coney's body reportedly said it looked like his throat had been slashed. Well, the story goes that in the days prior to his death, Coney told his mother that he had been present when Kevin and Don were killed by two men, but he didn't provide any specific details. The second death I want to talk about in this episode is that of Keith McCaskill, and this is a weird one. McCaskill was the 44-year-old owner of a local club called the Wagon Wheel Lounge, and even though he was believed to be a drug user and seller, he was also a helpful informant for the authorities, and a pretty well-liked guy in general, as he even counted Curtis Henry as one of his friends. But on November the 10th, 1988, McCaskill's body was found wrapped in a shower curtain in the carport of his home, and he had been stabbed over 100 times. The murder took place only two days after the election for Saline County Sheriff, and McCaskill had reportedly been seen in his club stating, quote, If Jim Steed loses this election, my life isn't worth two cents, end quote. And prior to this, McCaskill had been interviewed by Richard Garrett in order to assist with the investigation into Don and Kevin's murders, and was reportedly displaying paranoid behavior. Well, only 48 hours after McCaskill's murder took place, Ronald Shane Smith, a 19-year-old neighbor who lived across the street from him, was arrested for the crime. Smith, who had an IQ of 81, was implicated when some of his bloody clothes were found inside a garbage bag in a river, and he gave a number of wild and contradictory stories to police, including that he had seen three men in clown masks at McCaskill's residence. The story Smith eventually settled on was that he had visited McCaskill before five men in black masks broke into the house. While one of them held Smith captive, the other four dragged McCaskill outside and brutally murdered him. Afterward, they took Smith to McCaskill's body, where he tripped and got blood all over his clothing. The men then forced Smith to hold a knife over McCaskill while they took a photo of him, and then they let him leave. Well, as unbelievable as Smith's story might have sounded, the actual murder weapon was never found, and there was physical evidence at the scene which did not match Smith, including a hair found clutched in McCaskill's hand. When Smith went on trial, he was found guilty of second-degree murder and received a 10-year prison sentence, but the Arkansas Supreme Court would later overturn the conviction on appeal. 
They ruled that Smith had not received a fair trial because Judge John Cole, the same judge who had overseen the grand jury investigation, had improperly refused to allow some key testimony to be entered into evidence. This testimony had been provided by several eyewitnesses who claimed that McCaskill had appeared frightened and said his life was in danger in the days prior to his murder. As a result, the charges against Smith were dismissed and he was released from prison and no one else has ever been arrested for the crime. If you're wondering how the Keith McCaskill murder fits into everything, well, he would later be accused of being present at the train tracks when Don and Kevin were killed. But to provide some more context about this, I first have to talk about Dan Harmon, the special deputy prosecutor in the grand jury investigation into the train deaths. In 1990, Harmon wound up being elected Saline County prosecuting attorney, but over the next several years, he would be surrounded by controversy, as he was believed to be a heavy drug user who was heavily involved in drug dealing and tax evasion, and a number of different spouses would accuse him of domestic violence. In fact, even while the grand jury proceedings were taking place, Linda Ives claimed that her family often received hysterical phone calls from Harmon's wife, who said that her husband was hitting her. Throughout this time period, Harmon often butted heads with Gene Duffy, a deputy prosecutor who had been assigned by the state's 7th Judicial District to coordinate a newly created drug task force which was probing allegations of drug-related corruption among Saline County officials. This included Dan Harmon, but Duffy claimed that when she first started the job, she was specifically told by her supervisor, quote, you are not to use the drug task force to investigate any public officials, end quote. I'll talk more about the rivalry between Harmon and Gene Duffy later on, but I will say that there were a lot of rumors about drug trafficking in Saline County and that it was being used as a location for small airplanes to make drug drops. In fact, around the time period when Don and Kevin were killed, there had been numerous complaints from residents who claimed they would hear and see planes flying only about 100 feet above the train tracks in the middle of the night with their lights off. At one point, Duffy even managed to track down a pilot who told her that he had flown this route to perform drug drops on numerous occasions. By 1993, the Saline County Sheriff's Office assigned a new investigator named John Brown to the case, and he would interview a woman named Charlene Wilson, who was known for being an informant, and was currently incarcerated in the Hot Spring County Jail on drug charges. Wilson had once dated Dan Harmon while he was married to another woman, but she made a shocking confession that she had been at the train tracks on the night Don and Kevin were killed, and that Harmon and some other men, one of whom was Keith McCaskill, were present as well. According to Wilson, they were at the tracks to receive a drug drop that night and killed the two boys when they happened to stumble upon the scene. Wilson did pass a polygraph when questioned about these events, but Harmon reportedly went ballistic when he learned that John Brown had been questioning her and denied all of her allegations. Since he had the power of being Saline County prosecuting attorney, Harmon ensured that Wilson received a 30-year prison sentence, even though this was only her second offense and the drug charges were relatively minor. It also turned out that Wilson wrote up a confession letter in which she claimed that she was high on drugs on the night of the murders, but she changed one key detail, now confessing that she took a knife and personally stabbed one of the boys in the back while they were laid out on the tracks. However, for unknown reasons, this confession letter was kept hidden in the files for over 20 years, and Linda Ives did not learn of its existence until 2015. Near the end of 1993, Linda was put in touch with a second witness named Tom Niehaus, who seemed to corroborate Wilson's story. During the early morning hours of August 23, 1987, when Niehaus was only 10 years old, he claimed that he was wandering through the woods with two other friends because they had heard rumors that a marijuana patch was there. They soon saw two teenage boys, likely Kevin and Don, approaching a group of five individuals on the railroad tracks, and Niehaus recognized one of them as Dan Harmon, as he had once dated Niehaus's mother. It wasn't long before a gunshot was suddenly fired, prompting Niehaus and his friends to take off into the woods. Niehaus would be turned over to the FBI for questioning, where he wound up passing a polygraph test before he was placed in protective custody. But for whatever reason, Nothing ever came of this development, and Niehaus died of medical issues in February of 2013. While the FBI agreed to work on the case for over a year and a half, they eventually made the abrupt decision to close the investigation. According to Linda, during her final meeting with them, an agent told her, quote, There's no evidence. It might be time for you to consider the fact a crime has not been committed, end quote. By this point, Linda had become so frustrated that she had aligned herself with a filmmaker named Patrick Matriciana, who had produced a controversial documentary called The Clinton Chronicles in 1994. Yes, as you probably guessed, it chronicled a number of the crimes and scandals which Bill Clinton was alleged to have been involved in, and Matriciana had approached Linda about appearing in the documentary to share the story about what happened to her son. While the saga of what happened to Kevin and Don only took up a few minutes in the Clinton Chronicles, Matriciana agreed to produce a follow-up documentary which focused entirely on that story, and Linda would have full editorial control. It was released in May of 1996 under the title Obstruction of Justice, The Mina Connection. If you're wondering what Mina is, that's a reference to another town in Arkansas, which was the site of a major drug trafficking scandal during the 1980s, but that's a topic I'll hold off on discussing until part two of this episode. Anyway, the documentary alleged that Don and Kevin were the victims of a massive cover-up involving corruption and drugs, and near the end, they put up a graphic which read, 
suspects implicated in Ives Henry murders and cover up. They then posted a series of names under it Dan Harmon, Richard Garrett, Jim Steed, Jay Campbell, Kirk Lane, and Danny Allen. Well, I've already shared most of those names with you already, but the two names I haven't mentioned yet are Jay Campbell and Kirk Lane, so now's a good time to talk about them. To provide some geography, the location where this crime took place in Saline County was very close to Pulaski County, and in 1987, Campbell was working as an undercover narcotics detective with the Pulaski County Sheriff's Office, while Lane was lieutenant with the Pulaski County Sheriff's Department. At one point during the original grand jury proceedings, Dan Harmon told Linda that her son's killers would be appearing to testify the following day, and the next people who showed up were Campbell and Lane, who did not have a known connection to the case at that point. Well, long story short, Campbell and Lane matched the descriptions of the two police officers who were supposedly seen beating up Kevin and Don in the parking lot of the Ranchette grocery store. In fact, Mike Crook said that his friend Jerry specifically recognized Lane, and Crook also claimed that in the days prior to his murder, Keith McCaskill had told him that he believed Lane and Campbell were following him around. Now, the Obstruction of Justice documentary never flat out accused them of any specific crimes, and the only time Campbell and Lane's names were mentioned at all was in that aforementioned graphic, but they both felt this was grounds to file a $16 million lawsuit against Patrick Matriciana for libel. In fact, the two men claimed that they had been investigating Dan Harmon for potential drug offenses back in 1988, which is why he called them in front of the grand jury and attempted to point the finger at them as potential suspects. When the suit went to court in a civil defamation trial, one of the surprise witnesses for the plaintiffs was John Brown, who had been investigating the murders for the Saline County Sheriff's Office just a few years earlier. Brown testified that he had warned Matriciana against using Campbell and Lane's names in the film, though Matriciana would always maintain this was untrue. Regardless, the jury wound up ruling in Campbell and Lane's favor, and they were awarded nearly $600,000 in damages. However, a few years later, the verdict was reversed for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, who stated, quote, Although we do not intend to insinuate guilt, we note that neither had an alibi for the date and time of the deaths, and therefore, had they been asked for their side of the story, they very likely would not have contributed much more than a denial, and perhaps an explanation of the animosity between themselves and Harmon, which was already apparent to the factual editors, end quote. Well, speaking of Dan Harmon, Karma would finally catch up to him when he was arrested on 11 different felony charges in October of 1996. When he went on trial several months later, he was found guilty of one count of racketeering, three counts of extortion, and one count of possessing marijuana with the intent to distribute. Harmon was granted supervised release until a sentencing hearing, but he wound up committing more crimes when he left the county to deliver drugs to his girlfriend. As a result, he wound up going on trial again and being convicted of four all-new drug charges, and in the end, he received an 11-year prison sentence. However, he continued to deny any involvement in the murders of Don Henry and Kevin Ives. Harmon has since been released from prison, and he's still alive today, but two of the other law enforcement officials who were named as co-conspirators, Richard Garrett and former sheriff Jim Steed, have since passed away. Sometime during the late 1990s, the website I mentioned in the intro, idfiles.com, was started, with the I in the title standing for Linda Ives and the D for one of her biggest allies, Gene Duffy. It's one of the most extensive sources of information about the case and contains many documents from the original FBI investigation, though a lot of them are so heavily redacted that they do not provide much useful information which is not already public knowledge. In recent years, Linda has filed a lawsuit under the Freedom of Information Act against nearly a dozen state and federal agencies in hopes of obtaining additional unredacted documents about her son's case. In the end, Linda and her attorney only wound up receiving a handful of documents which were still heavily redacted and contain no useful information, and the lawsuit has since been dismissed. We are nearing the end of part one, but there is one more truly bizarre development from recent years which we have to talk about. In February of 2018, it was announced that former professional wrestler William Albert Haynes, who was best known for wrestling under the name Billy Jack Haynes, had come forward and confessed his involvement in the Boys on the Tracks murders. Billy Jack had gotten in touch with Linda through a private investigator she had hired named Keith Rounceval, and he would share the full story in a 21-minute YouTube video in hopes of raising money for the investigation. Back in 1987, Billy Jack was still employed as a full-time wrestler for the World Wrestling Federation, but he claimed that he also worked as an enforcer for a drug trafficking operation and would transport cocaine from Arkansas to his home state of Oregon on the side. On August the 21st, after wrestling at a show in Detroit, Billy Jack said that he received a phone call asking him to travel to Saline County. A man whom Billy Jack described as a quote-unquote criminal politician had become suspicious that cash from his drug drops was going missing, so Billy Jack was asked to provide security on the next one. Well, according to Billy Jack, he met up with individuals who worked for this politician, but things went horribly wrong when Don Henry and Kevin Ives stumbled upon their drug drop and were ambushed. While Billy Jack denied taking part in murdering the two boys, he admitted that he helped move their bodies onto the tracks and personally placed Don's rifle next to him. Now, if you follow me at all, you might know that I'm a lifelong professional wrestling fan, so I definitely have a lot of thoughts about Billy Jack Haynes, but I'll hold off on sharing them until part two. 
After three decades, the murders of Don Henry and Kevin Ives have still never been solved, and the whole saga of the boys on the tracks has ballooned into one of the most convoluted mysteries of all time. So I guess you could say, the trail went cold. Until next week, at least. Okay, I think by this point your heads might be ready to explode because of all the information I've shared with you, so that about brings an end to part one, and I will return next Wednesday with our follow-up episode. I've provided most of the basic facts, but there's a lot more information about this story I still haven't revealed, so stay tuned. When we return, I'm going to flesh out many of the details I provided, as well as provide my own theories and analysis in an attempt to put together this massive jigsaw puzzle. Anyway, another special thanks to listener Ryan Hanna for narrating the opening of our episode. If you've already entered our listener voiceover contest before, you are automatically eligible for our next random drawing, so you don't have to do anything. But if you would like to enter and haven't done so yet, all you have to do is send me an email under the subject line Trail Went Cold Contest, naming the one unsolved cold case you would most like to see covered on this podcast. So once again, send me an email under the subject line Trail Went Cold Contest to robin.warder at iCloud.com. That's robin.warder at iCloud.com. Now the reminder that The Trail Went Cold is on Patreon, so please visit patreon.com slash the trail went cold to learn how you can support our podcast and become eligible for some pretty neat rewards. We produced a bunch of exclusive bonus episodes for our patrons in tiers 2 and 3, and this past month, I released an episode about the notorious Zip Gun Bomber, an unidentified individual who sent booby trap packages to a number of different people that were rigged with a homemade Zip Gun device which fired off bullets when the packages were opened. And for our patrons in Tier 3, I've also recorded another new audio commentary track, which can be played over a classic episode of Unsolved Mysteries. I'd also like to take a moment to give a shout-out to our most recent listeners who have signed up with us on Patreon this week, and they are Cheryl C., Paloma A., Kelly P., and Stanislav M. Thank you all so much for your support. I also want to announce that this coming Saturday, February the 20th, I will be participating in an all-day live stream podcast-a-thon fundraiser on Get Vocal, in which myself and a number of other true crime podcasters will be raising money for our favorite missing persons website, The Charlie Project. The event will run from 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time until midnight, and throughout the course of the day, we will be live streaming a number of shows from different true crime podcasts, such as True Crime Bullshit, Crime Lines, Crime Writers On, True Crime Fan Club, Wine and Crime, The Fall Line, and many more. My live show will take place between 5.45 and 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where I will be discussing the Charlie Project's influence on The Trail Went Cold. I will include all the necessary information about this event in our show notes, and you can also find it pinned to the top of our Facebook and Twitter pages. Once again, the all-day podcast-a-thon takes place on Get Vocal this coming Saturday, February the 20th, from 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time until midnight, and we hope to see you there. And before I bring this episode to a close, I'd like to play a promo for another true crime podcast, Murderific. My name is Bernadette, the host of Murderific True Crime Podcast. Murder plus horrific equals murderific. I cover some cases from the state of Maine in the United States and all over the world. Mass murders, domestic abuse, unsolved cases, serial killers, and mostly lesser known subjects. We don't shy away from the details, but we do that with all respect. This isn't entertainment. These are real people's lives, and I'm here to tell their story. Join me for my season five reboot, and together we will be executing podcasts one crime at a time. Anyway, I need to provide another special thanks to the two men who have been alongside me on this podcast's five-year ride. Miguel Foote, who edits and assembles the show for me, and Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. We will finally conclude the celebration of this special milestone in our next episode, so I want you all to have yourselves a great week and join us next Wednesday as we present part two of the Boys on the Track saga on our special anniversary edition of The Trail Went Cold. Thank you.